The year is 2019. Dragon Ball has undergone a massive cultural resurgence, evidenced perhaps no better by the new Dragon Ball Super Broly movie grossing an astonishing $100 million at the worldwide box office. With Dragon Ball Super poised to return any day now, and the franchise overall grossing billions of dollars each year, there's no question about it. Dragon Ball as a whole will be capturing the hearts of an entirely new audience as this resurgence continues. Many Western fans were first exposed to the Dragon Ball franchise through Dragon Ball Z, and likewise, any new fan hoping to follow the stories told through Dragon Ball Super will have to watch Z if they want to keep up. DBZ remains one of the most popular, culturally significant, and beloved television shows of all time, and this very month of April 2019 officially marks its 30th anniversary. Of course, the show's run on television has long since ended here in North America, yet the characters, stories, and moments remain cemented in the public consciousness. However, for someone looking to get into the series for the very first time, or just enjoy it all over again in its entirety, one question remains unanswered. It's a simple question, but also a really important one. What's the best way to buy and watch the entire series? I see this question asked all the time, but somehow, as a hardcore Dragon Ball fan for over 20 years now, I can't easily answer this question. This problem doesn't exist for other highly regarded TV shows. Hell, it doesn't even exist for the other Dragon Ball shows. Not only is there no perfect release of Dragon Ball Z currently in print, but there isn't any release at the moment that I could recommend you spend your money on in good faith. Just how the hell did Dragon Ball Z end up in this situation? Well, wait a second. Earlier this month, Funimation and Toei came out and revealed that a 30th anniversary collector's edition box set of the entire show would be coming to Blu-ray. Many fans, myself included, speculated that this might finally be the much-needed perfect answer to our unanswered question. Well, we got our first details and the official trailer for the set, and from the looks of things, this 30th anniversary set might just be the very worst release of DBZ yet. A seemingly impossible task, given the property's painful history of poor home releases here in North America. To truly appreciate just how horrid this 30th anniversary release is, and why the Dragon Ball community is so furious right now, we really need the full perspective on the situation. And that's exactly why I decided to make this video. Well, my friends, the history of Dragon Ball Z in North America is a long and winding road, spanning 20 plus years with a few highs and some very low lows. With the reveal of this 30th anniversary collection, the quote unquote best way possible ultimate edition, as Funimation likes to call it, in the best way possible ultimate edition, we will be adding yet another bastardized release of Dragon Ball Z to the timeline. And just like that, two decades worth of bad memories washed over me like a tidal wave. This is Dropping the Ball, the story of Funimation's constant, embarrassing, inexplicable, and insulting treatment of the Dragon Ball Z franchise on home video in North America. To do this story justice, we really need to go right back to the very beginning. It's crazy, but many of you watching this probably weren't even born when Dragon Ball Z received its first home video release in North America. Dragon Ball Z Arrival contained the first four episodes of DBZ and was released in August of 1997 on VHS, and amazingly enough, the DVD version released exactly 20 years ago this month, in April of 1999. These were the early days of anime, kids. We were usually looking at three episodes on one disc, and it was gonna set you back 20 to 25 bucks a pop. Hell, here in Canada, I remember buying VHS tapes of DBZ that contained three episodes and cost $40 for one tape. It's also important to note that these very early releases contained the censored Ocean dub. 
and since each episode was edited down so heavily from the original Japanese version, there was no real way to logically sync the Japanese audio to these episodes, so a secondary Japanese audio track simply wasn't a thing for DBZ DVDs, at least not yet. Nonetheless, I loved my OG DBZ videos and DVDs. Going through these, I really can't help but smile as the nostalgic memories just wash over me. The truth is, these releases were totally fine for the time. 25 bucks for three episodes might seem insane in a world where Netflix costs 10 bucks a month, but back then, for what I thought was literally the greatest thing money could buy, it was more than worth it. Eventually, we reached the Ginyu Saga, where the famous switchover took place, and the English voices transitioned over to the cast we all know and recognize today. On DVD, the episodes themselves were now fully uncut and unedited, which meant the introduction of the Japanese audio track being selectable for every episode. An amazing extra at the time for someone who only had access to the Japanese version of DBZ through super tiny postage stamp sized movie files downloaded off Kazaa or fan sub VHS tapes, which were even more expensive than the official releases, if you could even believe that. Your friends from Earth, if you think they're going to. This original wave of DVD releases for Dragon Ball Z ran from April of 1999 all the way to November of 2005. As you could imagine, dubbing and releasing a 291 episode anime that was airing concurrently on TV in sets of 3 or 4 episodes per volume wasn't exactly the most speedy process. It also didn't help that these releases were totally all over the place and out of order. In the end, a grand total of 86 individual volumes were released, and if you wanted the entire Dragon Ball Z story on home video, you were going to have to buy them all. At a rough price of $25 per volume new, that meant buying the entire franchise could have cost you over $2,000, if you couldn't find any of them on sale. But again, I regularly ran across these discs and tapes selling for above retail during DBZ's heyday in North America. So the bottom line was you were going to pay out the ass for all of these things no matter what. Even if you did manage to track them all down, there was still a little issue. Remember those ocean dub sets I mentioned? Well, with the censorship done on those early episodes, so much footage was edited out that ultimately the episode count for the first 67 episodes of DBZ was actually compressed down to 53 episodes. It was basically a prototype Dragon Ball Kai when you think about it. So while everything from the Ginyu Saga forward was available on DVD in its proper form, uncut, and with Japanese audio, those first 67 episodes remained in a kinda weird limbo. That is, until the aptly named Ultimate Uncut Edition DVDs were announced. Come 2005, with the rest of Z now on DVD, Funimation finally decided to return back to those first 67 episodes, and put them out not only in unedited form, but also redubbed with the new voice cast that everyone had now become very familiar with. The releases followed the same format as the others, with 3 or 4 episodes per volume at 30 bucks a pop. Finally, fans will be able to own all 291 episodes of DBZ, completely uncut in either English or Japanese, depending on your preference. It was an exciting time, and these releases were well received by the Dragon Ball community. But this is also where the first real bump in the road appeared. The first of many. Oh, how quaint it feels all these years later. In 2006, the three episodes a pop format was quickly becoming outdated. More and more TV shows were being released on DVD in season sets. As someone who collected many of the other DBZ DVDs and was willing to pay a premium for my favorite show in the entire world, I was personally fine with this and just looked forward to the Ultimate Uncut Editions reaching episode 67 so I could complete my collection. But, for anyone who was looking to get into the series for the first time, or even longtime fans who simply missed out on a DVD or two, keeping track of over 70 separate releases was becoming a damn near impossible task. It was also clear that stores were not going to stock 70 DBZ DVDs, plus Dragon Ball, plus GT, 
plus the movies, no matter how popular the show had become. And believe me, it was popular and the demand was there. So the rumblings of potential Dragon Ball Z season sets began as the Ultimate Uncut editions continued to roll out. As of May 2006, the expectation was that after the uncut editions wrapped up, we would almost certainly be getting season sets for Dragon Ball Z that offered an overall better value proposition, lower prices, more episodes per set, and in a form that could be easily stocked on store shelves. Perhaps these sets would even come with the remastered video, as the video quality, especially on some of those earlier DVDs, was looking pretty muddy by 2006 standards with low bit rates and such. This video quality just wasn't going to cut it in this new era. A new era of high-def games, high-def video, and widescreen TVs. There was reason for optimism as these season sets loomed over the horizon. Besides the fact that we'd finally be able to own the entire series through digestible, easier to find, and far cheaper sets, over in Japan, DBZ fans had received a DVD release that had become the holy grail of the Western fanbase. In 2003, the legendary Dragon Boxes were released. Not to be confused with the vibrating seats at your local movie theater, the Dragon Boxes were basically the dream release for fans of Japanese Dragon Ball. The 291 episode series was released through two 26 disc DVD box sets. Each and every episode was remastered frame by frame with the original 16mm film used as source material. Oh, and Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball GT, and ZA movies all received the same treatment. The Dragon Boxes were the ultimate collector's item. They were expensive, and they were limited, but most important of all, they were pristine releases that were immensely respectful to the franchise, providing the show a gorgeous remaster and even including tons of goodies from the Toei Vault. Comparison shots appeared online regularly comparing them to the Ultimate Uncut editions, and it was like night and day. This is what we wanted Funimation, and surely it was what we were going to get with these upcoming season sets. I mean, the episodes are right there. The remaster is done, just take those, throw your dub on the disc, and we're good to go, right? Well, things wouldn't go exactly as the Western Dragon Ball fanbase had planned. May 16th, 2006 marked the DVD release of episodes 25 to 27, and then there was nothing. The Ultimate Uncut Editions have been quietly cancelled. Indeed, not a word came out of Funimation regarding the cancellation of these releases, which was especially amusing since they released this box set coinciding with the Vegeta Saga 2 releases. The poor suckers who bought this thing received Volume 1, and then they could fill the rest of the box with Volumes 2, 3, and 4 when they were released. To this day, that box will never be filled. This abrupt cancellation will always, to me, mark the very first of many lows that the DBZ fanbase would have to experience in North America when it came to DBZ home releases. It was the first instance of Funimation really taking the fanbase for granted. But it didn't stop there. Oh my lord. If anything, it was just an omen. A bad omen. The quiet cancellation of the Ultimate Uncut Editions was nothing compared to the absolute shitstorm that was about to come. After being left in the dark for most of the year, Funimation finally came out in November of 2006 and revealed the Dragon Ball Z season set DVDs with this infamous trailer. Brace yourself and prepare to embark upon the biggest event in Dragon Ball Z history. The trailer mapped out Funimation's bold new direction for Dragon Ball Z on home video, and it was like a nightmare for the fanbase. In some twisted attempt to modernize the franchise, Funimation decided to clean up the footage of the show itself by cropping the top and bottom of the frame to a 16 by 9 aspect ratio in order to make it fit a widescreen TV. They also applied poor digital video noise reduction over the image, blurring it and in some cases, utterly destroying the art itself. The trailer was cringeworthy from top to bottom. 
A new era of Dragon Ball Z has been activated. New video, new audio, a completely new experience. No compromises, no restraints. All Dragon Ball Z. Experience the classic series as it was originally intended. This pitch, this attempt to sell fans on a billion dollar worldwide phenomenon of a franchise, sounded like it came from a sleazy used car dealer. Funimation's attempts to frame their poor decisions as good ones were misleading at best or outright lies at worst. They bragged about presenting an ultimate and definitive edition of Dragon Ball Z as obstructed footage of the show plays in the background. The description of their remastering process was, in fact, a lie. They did not have access to the original 16mm film prints, which were used to produce the pristine Dragon Box remasters. Instead, this footage and faux remaster was based on a multi-generational copy of that footage that Toei sent to Funimation and other international distributors of the show. As we'd later learn, it's not like it's impossible to create a great remaster based on a copy, but I guess that doesn't sound very sexy in the marketing. So instead, let's just lie. The trailer claimed the show would be newly remastered. Indeed, the show was going to be remastered in one way or another, but it would be through an automated digital video noise reduction process that did more to destroy the footage rather than enhance it in any way. DVNR is a quick, easy, and cheap process that certain lazy-ass, stupid-ass companies will use to clean up the image of an older film, TV show, or cartoon. This is done by completely eradicating all grain from the image, because grain is bad for some reason. It's completely backwards since there's a major problem that comes with any remaster that removes all grain from an image. Grain contains detail from the image that you're seeing. By removing grain, you're removing detail. I'm sure by now you've seen many side-by-side -side comparisons between proper video remasters and poor video remasters, and usually the most disturbing shots are the result of poor DNR, absolutely destroying the detail in an image, resulting in shots just looking blurry and awful, or at worst, are straight up missing elements from the original image. DNR looks absolutely terrible every time it is used to restore an older release, whether it's animated or live action. I can't understand the rationale behind ever using it for a professional release, especially for a popular and beloved movie or franchise. Just look at these screen caps, it makes me want to throw up. And I assure you, it looks a million times worse in motion. Cheaply done DNR with clearly zero review process over at the Funhouse predictably yields disastrous results. So much detail is being lost and so little care is taken that we find scenes like this in the final product, where someone is powering up and the screen gets all shaky and awesome and stuff and lines literally vanish. Goku has finally achieved a new powerful form, the legendary Super Saiyan No-Face. The fact that this made it into the final product and was sold for real money to people is an absolute embarrassment. You'd have to be downright nutty to still be using DNR for a Blu-ray release in 2019. If you want to reduce grain but still retain detail, it is possible, but you would need, you know, a proper budget, some kind of passion behind the project, you know, stuff like that. It's been done and it continues to be done. You'd think that the most beloved and popular anime of all time might deserve that kind of treatment, but no, just throw that crap in the DNR machine, the stupid kids will never notice. Perhaps the biggest offender of this entire Orange Bricks debacle was the introduction of the widescreen format for Dragon Ball Z. I'm going to quickly go over the history here. Dragon Ball Z was produced in 4x3 format. It began airing in 1989 and ran in Japan until 1996. This isn't hard, kids. TVs used to look like this. Eventually, the standard changed and now our TVs look like this. 16x9. 
perfectly fine for most movies as they were filmed in 16 by 9 but for older cartoons like Dragon Ball Z, yeah, it's not ideal. For 4x3 releases, you're going to be looking at some black bars on the left and right side of the image. However, if that really frustrates you, there's an option on every single remote that I've ever seen called the zoom function or the stretch function. This allows you to take the image and either stretch it to fit your nice big widescreen TV or you zoom in and cut off the top and bottom of the image to make it fit the screen. I see people taking advantage of these features all the time and it seems to work for them. If you don't want to do anything to the image, you could just leave it. That's what I do. However, for whatever reason, Funimation decided to make the decision for us. You don't get a choice, sucker. They decided, I guess because it sounded sexy in the marketing, to release the show in widescreen by cropping Dragon Ball Z at the top and bottom of the screen for all 291 episodes. Of course, it doesn't take a genius to realize that we were going to run into some problems really quickly with this stupid ass decision. It was clear as early as season one with examples like this and this and this. Amazingly, these jokers actually tried to damage control the fact that 20% of the image was cropped by claiming that more footage could be seen on each side. Imagine taking this image and saying, well, damn, everybody, look, this looks great. Look at all that extra footage on the left side and the right side. This looks great. This was actually their strategy. Again, the sleazy used car salesman analogy comes to mind. Both the trailer and press release kept on delivering lie after lie. Funimation claimed the sets would feature unaltered colors, brightness, contrast, and saturation. For a fan base lusting over the Dragon Box transfers, the claims were laughable when comparing the two side by side. While it would become clear years later that the Dragon Box colors were not perfect either, the picture provided with the orange bricks was absolutely blown out, extremely oversaturated, and simply not accurate. Perhaps an even worse fallout of these poor choices is that a generation of fans seem to be brainwashed into believing this overly saturated style is a part of Dragon Ball's distinct look. Just looking at random clips of DBZ posted to YouTube, the blown out, oversaturated, and slick, grain free look seems to have caught on like wildfire, and many clips from the show with millions of views are presented in this terrible form, going even further than Funimation ever did with inaccurate and just flat out terrible post processing effects. Sometimes it feels like their marketing team hasn't gone through many changes over the last 15 years. But anyways, I could write a book on everything wrong with these orange brick sets, a nickname truly earned. But for today, I think we only need to focus on those three major issues that to this day, Funimation seems unwilling to let go of no matter how much blowback they receive from the fanbase. Three problems with this release that somehow made a relatively cheap season set of the greatest cartoon ever made into an unwatchable mess that I couldn't possibly recommend anyone actually go out and buy themselves. It was clear as day to many fans, especially those who followed the Dragon Box releases in Japan, that this was a poor product. And that's putting it very lightly. As I recall, this was probably the most painful time to be a Dragon Ball fan that I could ever remember. For many fans, especially fans of the Japanese version, we just wanted an easy way to own the show. Unfortunately, the bottom line was this. This was the only way to buy the most popular anime in the world for a reasonable price, and in the case of those early episodes, literally the only way to buy them in any uncut form. The season sets, despite their absolutely embarrassing treatment of the original source material, sold like hotcakes. Season 1 was the best-selling anime DVD of 2007, and the orange bricks became fixtures at any Best Buy or Walmart DVD section for years to come. I personally bought the first two orange bricks simply because I had no other choice if I wanted to watch those episodes in Japanese, but stopped at that point and continued to collect the original 4x3 DVDs, slowly. I don't lie when I say these sets were literally offensive to the eye and basically unwatchable. 
the fact that 20% of the screen was being obscured was like a constant slap in the face. Any time I tried to watch, it would just take me out of the show entirely. The Orange Bricks continued to be released in a consistent fashion until May of 2009. The nine sets were all out there and the entire DBZ anime was now easy to find and cheap on DVD. But yet, our question could not be answered adequately. Are you kidding me? As soon as I first saw that trailer, I knew I could never recommend these terrible things in good faith. It felt really hopeless at the time. These things sold like crazy, the masses seemed to be okay with the cropping in the DNR, and all the while, the holy grail known as the Dragon Box seemed like it would just be Japan only forever. An impossible dream for English speaking fans of Dragon Ball. Then, the impossible became possible. At Otakon in July of 2009, a mere two months after the final Orange Brick release, Funimation announced that the Dragon Boxes would be coming to North America. Just like that, basically out of nowhere. The set was clearly aimed at fans of the Japanese version, even defaulting to the Japanese language track. Each of the seven box sets contained gorgeous 80-page dragon books, and best of all, it wasn't going to cost us 200,000 yen to own the entire series. Each set would contain about 42 episodes and cost 80 bucks, which was peanuts for hardcore Dragon Ball fans considering it was such a dream release. Remember when these things cost 30 bucks for three episodes? Of course, the series would be presented in its proper 4x3 aspect ratio, and the remaster was directly from Toei themselves, a pristine, legitimate frame-by-frame -frame remaster that a series this beloved and renowned deserves. This was truly the release from the Dragon Ball gods. I can't say enough how low a certain portion of the Dragon Ball fanbase felt as the orange bricks were just taking over the world. It was the lowest of lows, but now, the Dragon Box release would represent the highest of highs. I pre-ordered every single one of these bad boys the moment they were available for pre-order, and to this day, they are some of my most prized possessions. After all, it's the best way to watch Dragon Ball Z in its entirety to this very day. But unfortunately, the journey does not end here with this euphoric high. The North American Dragon Boxes rolled out from November 2009 to September 2011, and during that time frame, all of a sudden, things were changing. Not only were things changing in the world of home video standards, but the world of Dragon Ball was changing too. For the first time in over a decade, Dragon Ball received new animated material. Yo Son Goku and his friend's return was well received, and around the same time, Toei decided that it was time to reintroduce Dragon Ball Z for a new generation of fans. Dragon Ball Kai was announced as a quote, refreshed version of Dragon Ball Z, and began airing in Japan in 2009. Soon after, Funimation announced that they had obtained the licensing rights for the show, and would begin dubbing and releasing the show on DVD, and Blu-ray. Outside of some poor movie releases, this would be Dragon Ball's first real foray into the world of high-definition home releases. While Kai was an abridged version of DBZ, fans couldn't help but salivate over seeing their favorite show represented in true HD resolution. Now, I don't for a second want to complain about the Dragon Box and its presentation. To this day, they are still an absolutely fantastic way to experience DBZ, and they still look great. But standards are always changing, and the fact is, Dragon Ball Z is big enough to deserve a top-of-the-line remaster that keeps up with any current trend. It should never be lagging behind other, quite frankly, lesser shows that manage to receive beautiful HD remasters. So yeah, as awesome as the Dragon Boxes were in 2011, I'd be lying if I said I didn't want a proper 1080p remaster of DBZ on Blu-ray. At least, someday. I'd also like to mention quickly that the Dragon Box releases did have its fair share of controversy around release. Even though they weren't marketed to them directly, fans of the Bruce Falconer score for DBZ were burned by the release. The D-Box only contained the Japanese audio, in addition to the dub with Kikuchi score, with no Falconer music to be found. So for fans of that dub, they were stuck dealing with the terrible orange bricks if they wanted to watch the entire series voiced and scored by the heroes of their choice. 
So take a look at the landscape here in September of 2011. Not only was the 7th and final Dragon Box finally on store shelves, but Dragon Ball Kai had been making its way out on DVD and Blu-ray as well, with episodes 66 to 77 having hit store shelves that same month. Less than a month later, a collected release of the first two Kai sets would hit the market as a season set, containing the first 26 episodes. Let's also not forget the orange bricks, which continued to sell like hotcakes and were still regularly stocked on store shelves all across the country. As you can see, I'm trying my best to organize all this crap with a graphic here, but it's not a simple task. It was clear at this point that Funimation was confusing people and dangerously close to oversaturating the market. So of course, the next logical step at this point would be to... announce Dragon Ball Z on Blu-ray. Huh. Just two months after the final Dragon Box release, we were looking at yet another version of Dragon Ball Z on home video. The level sets released in November of 2011, and they were everything I could have ever hoped for, and then some. And of course, one of the byproducts of resolution for any film is grain. Grain is what gives us the resolution. That's probably one of the most important things about this project is trying to be as true and honest and do the proper reproduction, if you will, of this film. 4x3? Check. A proper frame-by-frame -frame remaster in high definition with treatment and love worthy of the Dragon Ball name? Yes. The level sets actually looked better than the Dragon Boxes in basically every way. And keep in mind, this was an in-house remaster of the series by Funimation and not Toei themselves. The Ultimate Uncut Edition dub audio was present, in addition to the dub with Kikuchi score, and of course the original Japanese audio was on there as well. Soon enough, the Bruce Falconer dub would surely be a part of the set as well. This meant that even for fans of the dub, the level sets were the perfect Dragon Ball Z release from top to bottom. It even had a great price. Well, wait, not so fast. I can't say enough just how insane it was that a mere two months after the Dragon Box releases wrapped up in North America, Funimation jumped straight onto the next hype train and began putting out Z on Blu-ray. As a hardcore fan, I wasn't complaining. I did enough complaining about the bad release, I wasn't going to complain about a great release, no matter how poor the timing was. And boy, the timing on this release was as bad as bad could be. Look, here's the deal. I feel I'm as hardcore a Dragon Ball fan as they come. I'm obsessed with this stuff. I'm writing and making videos about it constantly. It's not healthy, okay? But even I have to admit, I couldn't muster up too much excitement for the level sets. In November of 2011, I had just come off paying a good $500 plus for all seven Dragon Boxes. At that time, just months after the final D-Box release, I didn't need to be spending 35 bucks for a mere 17 episodes of DBZ. The Dragon Boxes were just too fresh, and at the time, I was collecting the Kai Blu-rays as well. So honestly, these level sets? Of course I would buy them eventually, but for now, they could wait. It's not like they were going anywhere. I don't think I was alone with that thinking. Let's take a look at that Dragon Ball Z on home video situation here in December of 2011. And you thought September was bad? Let's just break down all the different ways one could buy the Saiyan Saga on home video at the time, how much each set cost, and how many episodes you were getting per set. We had the orange bricks on shelves, and at this point they could be found for dirt cheap. I remember seeing them available for 20 bucks a pop, an insane value for a 39 episode set. For the hardcore fans, the Dragon Boxes could still be found, though in smaller numbers as it was always marketed as a more limited release compared to the Orange Bricks. Finally, you had Kai, which at the time was really the new hotness. The marketing machine was totally behind Kai. The first Kai Blu-ray set was very popular and could easily be found in stores. Plus, the Saiyan Saga episodes were released again in October 2011 with that season set that I mentioned earlier. Kai felt like the hot branding, and people wanted to see this quasi new thing. It seemed like at the time, if you were going to buy Dragon Ball Z on Blu-ray, why buy the old one when you could grab the new hotness without the filler instead? 
and for a lower price with more episodes to boot. When it was released, the first level set could have been the fifth of five different home releases you'd find on store shelves containing the Saiyan Saga of DBZ. It was madness. Looking back on the situation here in late 2011, and considering the price to episode ratio for each set, it is abundantly clear that these level sets, these amazing labors of love that I truly appreciate and enjoy to this day, were sent out to die. Funimation had oversaturated the market bad. Almost as badly as they've oversaturated the image of DBZ on their home releases. Hey, I had to go there. You know, you, you like that one. I know you like it. I know you like that one. I know. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. For whatever reason, they did not want to give these releases any time to breathe. In a Q&A years later, they seemed oblivious to the fact that fans may have experienced burnout, even claiming that Kai was aimed at an entirely different audience from Z, which is just stupid. The level sets, as awesome as they were, bombed, and were quickly cancelled after only two sets and 34 episodes were released. It was a sad state of affairs, and there was definitely outrage from the community, but again, I have to bring up just how poorly timed this release was. As a result, the outrage wasn't even that vociferous from the Dragon Ball fanbase as hard to believe as that might be. So many of us were still reeling over the fact that our dream release had become a reality. We spent a lot of money on our Dragon Boxes, and we were happy with them. At the time, losing on the level sets was no big deal. Through 2012 and 2013, Funimation decided to finally take a step back and chill with all the damn home releases. The Orange Bricks continued to be the best-selling DBZ DVD sets, while Kai wrapped up its controversial and plagiarific run in June 2012 with episodes 90 to 98. While well, years later, the Boo Saga would receive the Kai treatment, but it's not really relevant to the story being told today, so let's stop talking about Kai now. Kai is trash, everyone. Don't watch it. As the years rolled on, the Dragon Boxes became more and more rare, and eventually went completely out of print. As expected, the first two sets containing those coveted first 67 episodes immediately became in demand from collectors, and would be regularly found going for well over double or even triple its retail price on eBay. As we made our way into 2013, we were quickly finding ourselves in the same scenario as before when all the original single disc DVDs were released. There was no great way to watch the entire show. The orange bricks were still awful. Kai wasn't Z, and besides, as far as we knew at the time, it wasn't actually going past the Cell Saga. Finally, the Dragon Boxes were now out of print and hard to find for a reasonable price. Not to mention we all blew it with those level sets. So what was next for Funimation? Surely now was the right time to continue the Blu-ray level sets, now that some more time had passed since that absolute barrage of releases in 2011. The level sets would probably do just fine here in 2014. The Dragon Ball fanbase was dreaming big. Oh boy, how quickly back to reality we came. A new Blu-ray release of DBZ was indeed on the horizon, but it was not quite going to deliver on those fanboy dreams. After doing extensive market research, Funimation had come to the conclusion that the masses preferred Dragon Ball Z in cropped, widescreen format over its proper 4x3 aspect ratio. Surely the success of the season sets had nothing to do with, you know, being the cheapest way to purchase one of the most popular TV shows on the planet. It had nothing to do with being available everywhere and providing great value. Nope, it was the widescreen and the digital noise reduction. Those are the cornerstones of any successful Dragon Ball Z home release. So, with this new Blu-ray release, they went back to the drawing board. The beautiful, respectful level sets failed, so what's the next logical step? Release the sleaziest, poorest possible presentation for Dragon Ball Z, again, but this time on Blu-ray. Dragon Ball Z is such an important show to the industry and to our company at Funimation, but because it's so important, we have a responsibility to do the best job we possibly can. And it's very important to us to do uh, the best job we can with the material. 
The season set is being presented uh, in 16 by nine. This was a show that was uh, produced from the late 80s to the mid 90s in Japan. So we have to take that and the season set is being presented uh, in 16 by nine. This will be the, um, the best presentation of the complete series yet. Now that we're looking at a Blu-ray of the complete series, we're looking at the orange box or the season sets and that uh, for DVD was an amazing product. Um, it had never before been seen on 16 by nine. It was brighter and bolder, it had a new look. What was good about that? What do we like about that? What made that really popular and, and people really enjoy it? Um, uh, this is not a process where we just sort of have a piece of software that just runs through and does some sort of magic process to fix everything automatically. We aren't just simply selecting a tool and saying, oh, okay, this uh, reduces noise, or really what we're doing is we're evaluating every shot so that it is framed uh, as correctly as possible. Our intent is to preserve the, the kind of original image that was intended. The season set is being presented uh, in 16 by nine, but mainly our intent is to really preserve the look and feel of this show the way it was intended. Um, there is a element of grain to the show. That grain is brought under control. The season set is being presented uh, in 16 by nine to stay true to how the show is meant to be seen, but give it the best quality possible. The season set is being presented uh, in 16 by nine. In a fan Q&A regarding the new Blu-ray releases, Funimation all but confirmed that their approach to the new set took inspiration based on the success of the Orange Bricks. During the same cringeworthy Q&A, Funimation was even quoted saying widescreen was a must to bring DBZ into the modern era. So yeah, be sure to pre-order your 30th anniversary sets, kids. Remember, it's the best way possible Ultimate Edition. In the best way possible Ultimate Edition in the original 4-3 aspect ratio. In the best way possible Ultimate Edition in the original 4-3 aspect ratio. So of course, Funimation would never take a step back and evaluate their mistakes, their poor marketing, poor timing, or any of the real factors that led to the success and or failures of their various DBZ home releases. Instead, they decided to learn all the wrong reasons, and that manifest in these new Blu-ray season sets. As you can imagine, the fanbase just loved that. They rolled out through 2013 and 2014, and were really just the infamous Orange Brick releases, but this time burned onto Blu-rays and in 1080p. Cropped and DNR'd to hell, just like the good old days. While Funimation took about 5 minutes to fix some of the footage so damaged by their DNR process that they basically became memes overnight, the Blu-ray season sets were in some ways worse than the Orange Bricks, and in most ways just equally as terrible. Unlike the level sets, the timing for the new Blu-ray season sets was impeccable and would enter a market ripe for their success, no matter how poor the actual release itself may have been. Come 2014, Blu-ray players were far more commonplace and the Orange Bricks were close to seven years old. They were no longer the staple of the DVD section at Walmart that they once were. While they can still be found here in 2019 on Amazon, it is indeed these new Blu-ray sets that come up first on the list when you search for Dragon Ball Z Season 1. The Dragon Boxes were now long out of print, all seven of which commanded a hefty premium on the secondary market. Their legend only grew in time as the official releases only got worse and worse. Even Kai had lost its luster by 2014 and was looked at less as an improved version of DBZ without filler and more as the poorly edited cut down version of Z that it really was with a bunch of jarring reanimated scenes that just took you out of the show. The demand for a complete DBZ release, a demand that was absent during that infamous late 2011 period, had returned wholeheartedly. But Funimation's solution to the problem was one just as offensive as the one they provided back in 2007. It was like the timeline had repeated itself, and for fans of Dragon Ball Z, we were experiencing that same low once again. This terrible Blu-ray release brings us here to the present day, with the announcement of a new 30th anniversary Blu-ray set. As we are gluttons for punishment, the DBZ community waited with bated breath to see what exactly this new 30th anniversary release would entail. Much like the speculative period of 2006 before the Orange Bricks were released, there was reason to actually be optimistic. We are just coming off a terrible, lazy release, 
So, at the very least, it couldn't be any worse, right? Maybe if we're really lucky, Funimation and Toei could even go above and beyond to deliver a truly perfect Dragon Ball Z experience. Over the last few years, the flaws of the Dragon Box release were becoming more and more glaring. A big discussion topic amongst the hardcore DBZ community is that of the original broadcast audio for DBZ. This topic could be its own focused video, but briefly, Toei basically threw away the original master audio tapes for Dragon Ball Z after it originally aired on TV because they took up too much space apparently, and they didn't have the foresight that maybe someday they would be able to sell these cartoons on home video. Instead, the audio we've had on every official release so far, including the immaculate Dragon Box releases, was pretty low quality and contained a distinct hiss. This becomes very easy to hear when audio is compared to episodes 229 and 237 of DBZ. The Big Box Dragon Ball Z, a Japanese release from 1994, actually contained a CD with the clean audio for these episodes of DBZ in particular. Why? Why the hell not? It's awesome. In fact, I actually own this thing for some reason. In any case, the audio on this CD gives fans a glimpse of how Dragon Ball Z should really sound and how truly poor the audio is on all of the official releases we've received so far. <laughs> Now, back to that broadcast audio. Basically, a Japanese superfan was actually able to get his hands on copies of the show directly recorded from its original airing, and actually managed to preserve the original broadcast audio. Indeed, the audio off these old smelly tapes blows away what we've heard from any official release. <laughs> Years back, fans actually even got into contact with Chris Sabat, who showed interest in this cleaned up audio. Could the broadcast audio maybe finally make its way into some sort of official release? We never heard any follow up on the situation, but perhaps now, with this 30th anniversary release, it was time. The other big discussion was surrounding the picture of the Dragon Box itself. Many questioned how accurate the colors in the set were from the very beginning, as the characters were frequently seen with odd pinkish skin, and blue skies appeared green as if we were fighting on planet Namek or something. Superfan K17 finally got in contact with Toei via email, and indeed it was finally confirmed that the original 16mm prints were fading when the Dragon Box remaster took place, and while Toei tried their best, the colors in the set were slightly inaccurate. Maybe the Dragon Box wasn't quite as perfect as we all thought, though in a sea of offensively bad home releases, it was and still is easily the best way to watch the show from start to finish. It seemed like the doomed level sets actually came closest to the real authentic colors of any home release, so the fans speculated that perhaps, in addition to this original broadcast audio, the original colors for Dragon Ball Z would also be restored with this 30th anniversary set. A true successor to the level sets, if you will. It would be the perfect set, and the perfect way to celebrate the series 30th anniversary. The other big news that we received regarding this 30th anniversary set is that it wasn't just strictly Funimation's endeavor. Indeed, Toei themselves were actually on board here with the production as well. With both parties on board, perhaps this time an increased budget would be allotted, and a situation that the level sets ran into where the intricate and love-filled remastering process was simply too expensive given the return would not be an issue this time around. The ingredients were in play here for this 30th anniversary set to be the perfect version of Dragon Ball Z. 
finally everything we wanted at the right time with the right people and the right amount of money and care put into it. Instead, we got this. This time on Dragon Ball Z, our heroes are celebrating. We've designed a striking set worthy of this legendary series. But to make this happen, we need 3,000 wishes. Uh, reservations in the best way possible. Ultimate edition in the original 4-3 aspect ratio. It was the 2007 season sets trailer all over again. As the cringe-worthy narration played out through my speakers, all I could picture was the used car salesman pitch once again, trying to sell me on a bastardized version of my favorite show. In a hilarious turn of events, 4x3 aspect ratio acts as a major marketing point for the set. They're trying to sell us back on the footage they tried to sell us off of back in 2007. It's amazing, and yet, they seemingly are unable to even do 4x3 right, overly cropping the image compared to the Dragon Box or level sets. It's like these jokers just hear buzzwords and have no concept of proper execution. Though the cropping of the image may not be quite as severe as the orange bricks, the use of DVNR continues to rear its ugly head, and Dragon Ball Z is once again smeared to hell and back. Grain is gone, and detail gone with it. The colors appear oversaturated once again, and there, ugh, there seems to be some kind of edge enhancement going on as well. It looks terrible. Who thinks this is a good idea? Let's closely examine this blog post, example 10 over the years of Funimation performing damage control after announcing a new DBZ home release to universally negative press. Funimation gives us a look at this original unaltered frame from DBZ. Man, that looks good. Now let's see how Funimation just destroys that shit. Like, this is actually a joke. They're showing us how great the show can look. Look at that. This looks amazing. It's right there. Then boom, Funimation goes to town. Cropped. DNR'd. Ruined. Thank you, Funimation, for creating this blog post to show the exact painstaking process of how you destroy every frame of my favorite show in the world. How is Dragon Ball Z treated like this? Doesn't this all sound far too familiar? How is Dragon Ball Z getting this kind of garbage release for its 30th anniversary? Perhaps the most insulting of all is Funimation's use of crowdfunding to greenlight the product. Think about this. On its 30th anniversary, meaning it's been around for 30 years. This billion dollar franchise is being held hostage. The Blu-ray set won't be made unless they receive 3,000 pre-orders and they will only be producing 6,000 sets in total. It's such a joke and even more of a joke considering how clearly low budget and Bush League this whole project is. As I write this video, the set just barely met its goal taking close to a week. The backlash on YouTube and social media has been brutal and tells me that the negative reception is causing bad word of mouth and thus pre-orders aren't as huge as they should be. I know I would have pre-ordered the thing immediately if it wasn't hot garbage and I know many others like me would have done the same. This thing should have sold out in two hours. I think it's safe to say that any dreams of the broadcast audio being included with this set is out the damn window, though to be honest that might be for the best. They certainly aren't interested in making a great set for the fans here with this 30th anniversary collection. All things considered, with what we know, with all that history that I just went over, and with all the pieces that were in place, this 30th anniversary set may well be the worst release of Dragon Ball Z yet. For both Funimation and Toei to knowingly put together a release like this, a release so poor, with marketing so insulting, Quite frankly, it gets my blood boiling. Quite frankly, it makes me want to write over 9,000 words on the topic and edit together a YouTube video about it. By any standard, the 30th anniversary set is a bad release. The video quality is poor and barely an improvement over the garbage that was the Blu-ray season sets. It doesn't even hold a candle to the Dragon Box transfer or the level sets. Given everything this set could be, Given all the history Dragon Ball Z has had in North America on home video, and labeling it as a celebration of the show's 30th anniversary to boot, it's an absolute disgrace. This is a disgrace. 
Here we are in 2019. Dragon Ball is bigger than ever, it's making more money than ever, and for many longtime fans, something we never thought would happen is happening. We have a new weekly Dragon Ball anime to watch and enjoy, but an essential part of the story, Dragon Ball Z, has no release that I could possibly recommend to new fans if they want to watch from start to finish. That question that I started the video with still has no simple answer and for the foreseeable future will remain unanswered. Is there reason to be optimistic? Well, right now, not really. But I do suppose that we could just be at another one of the many lows that the Dragon Ball fanbase has had to power through under Funimation's rule. Could they come out a month after the 30th anniversary set is released and announce a proper frame-by-frame -frame remaster with broadcast audio? I mean, sure. Is it any less likely than them coming out two months after the Dragon Boxes wrap up to announce a proper Blu-ray remaster? Anything could happen, and as we've learned today, it's just a constant roller coaster following this franchise. But for now, I will say this. Save your money. Don't support this terrible release. Don't blindly support the franchise if the license holders aren't going to respect the material itself. If you want to experience the show from start to finish in Japanese, buy the Dragon Boxes on the secondary market. If you want to experience the show from start to finish in English with the Bruce Falconer score, your best bet is to buy these DVDs from 15 plus years ago. There it is. The absolute state of Dragon Ball Z on home video in North America. If you like this video and want to see more fun Dragon Ball content, please hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. As painful as it was reliving some of those tougher times to be a Dragon Ball fan, and as painful as it is to see time repeating itself with this new 30th anniversary release, I gotta say, looking back at the last 20 years of message board posts and news posts from this bygone era of Dragon Ball fandom was really fascinating and a lot of fun. I'd like to do more of these deep dives into the history of Dragon Ball and how it affects the present, so definitely look forward to more videos like this soon. Just like all the other home releases, we'll just have to see how the future of Dragon Ball is affected by the performance of this 30th anniversary set. Dominoes are always falling with this franchise. Until next time, thanks so much for watching everyone, and take care.